Today marked the start of a new chapter in the grand history of this chamber. I will work with anyone and everyone to deliver a better future for the nation. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Mariana Sotomayor. I'm a congressional reporter here at The Washington Post covering the House of Representatives. So my guest today is no stranger to me and I to her. So you're often in the hallways here on Capitol Hill. Of course, that is Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar. She's a Republican from Florida representing my hometown of Miami. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us today. The wonderful. Isn't that a great town, the city of Miami? I love it. I love it. <laughs> Guaranteed to always be warm, have palm trees, make people happy. That's what I like about it. Um, Congresswoman, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about, I think it's fair to say, your passion, which is immigration reform. Literally, when you came to Capitol Hill two years yeah. ago, it was one of the first things that you introduced. It was called the Dignity Act. But in the last couple of years, you've tweaked it, you've refined it, and you found a Democratic co-sponsor in your colleague, Congresswoman Ver Veronica Escobar. What are the main planks of the Dignity Act? I know we've talked about it a long time, but what should our viewers remember about this bill? Well, what, and thank you for the opportunity, Mariana. Always a pleasure to be talking to you. You know, I was a journalist for so many years, so every time someone asks me to um, help them do a better job and to explain the legislation in a better fashion, I am here. So thanks again. Uh, the Dignity Act is what this country needs because we have a major big problem called immigration. In the last 30 years, uh, this body, Congress, has not been able to come together and create a legislation that is good for both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. So thanks to Veronica Escobar, um, um, and who's, uh, who's become a very good friend, we put together something called the Dignity Act. This is dignity, this is not amnesty for those who have been here undocumented for many years. And what does it do basically? It does few things. Number one, it seals the border. It controls the border. It puts order at the border because no country that respects itself could have the border in the situation that we have the southern border at this hour. Number two, it ends catch and release. Uh, you know that many people out of desperation, they have gamed the system, the asylum system. So we need to put in place a system that gives grants those who really merit it, asylum, and those who do not, they need to either not come in into the country or come in through other means, through other pathways, legal pathways. Number three, um, it mandates E-Verify. Because that is that if you are in, a, in, in your private sector, you need to make sure that those people who are working for you are legal. And, base, and, number th and, and basically, uh, one of the most important aspects of this bill is that it brings out of the shadows those people who have lived here for many years who are undocumented, people who are helping the economy, people who have not committed a crime, people who have been here for more than five years, have American kids, are can pay taxes, are working. So those people come out of the shadows under what I call the dignity status. And that is for seven years. And those seven years, you pay $5,000. You do not have access to government uh, programs because right now they don't have access to government programs. But you give them the opportunity. You give two things. You give the business sector, the private sector hands people to work. You know, there are so many uh, sectors right now, construction, hospitality, farming, saying, I need workers and I can't find them. Well, here we are. And they're not going to be now legal because they're going to be in the dignity status. That's basically it. And then after dignity, if those undocumented really want to become American citizens, then they go into the redemption path after seven years. Then they pay more money, they learn some English, they fill out more papers, and they go to the back of the line. I represented those people for many years. I was one of the founders of Univision. And we have a very big market, those people that speak the language, speak Spanish. And I can assure you that the overwhelming majority of the undocumented, let's say 10 million people, 13 million people, they do not necessarily want to be Americans. They don't want the path to citizenship. They want dignity first. 
And that's why I thought about them. And I, but even more, I'm thinking about that this is a national security bill and this is an economic bill. Because right now we are confronting that shortage that I just told you of workers, people that need to be here producing, paying taxes, going home for Christmas, but not being a burden on society. On the contrary, helping the economy. So one thing that I wanted to remind our viewers is in the past week, we've seen a number, a very small number of your Republican colleagues actually try and freeze the floor. We haven't seen any action. And the reason I bring that up is because one of their demands to McCarthy to reopen the floor, which we will see today, is that they just don't want to see any kind of bipartisan legislation. They don't want to work with Democrats. They don't want to see Democrats providing any votes on issues that they find extremely important. That your bill essentially is bipartisan. You have a number of co-sponsors. You you and Congresswoman Escobar are really working your own colleagues to make sure that this can come onto the floor. So, you know, you mentioned a little bit of how you're talking to your colleagues about this, including those in the Freedom Caucus. But yes. what are your plans if if you know they do block this from coming to the floor? Listen, my plan is for them to understand that this is good for everybody. That's why we're here, right? I mean, history demonstrates Tip O'Neill, Ronald Reagan, Clinton, Newt Gingrich. I mean, that's the way the founding fathers made this sauce. So why are we gonna be changing the sauce now? We've been pretty good for the last 300 years. So that's what I'm doing and I'm having, and I've been uh, um, well received by some of the members in the Freedom Caucus and I'm gonna be sitting with them very soon. I'm gonna be explaining to them why this is good. This is a national security bill, it seals the border. We need to put some order on the border. Everyone agrees with that. The bill that you that, that we just passed a month ago, the uh, GOP conference, is not getting any is not gaining any traction in the Senate. So we need to move this forward. And I know that in the Senate, the dignity bill is well it's is well received, will be very well received. So there's there's gonna be movement because uh, because the country needs it and the private sector is putting pressure on us and telling us we need to find workers. Otherwise, the number one economy in the world will not continue being the number one economy in the world because we will not be able to grow. I mean, it's simple, common sense. You mentioned order at the border. There are many different ways that a couple of your colleagues define that. Obviously, your bill does touch and provide a number of solutions to try and do that. but. A number of your colleagues are saying, you know what, the best way to do that right now is to actually impeach DHS Secretary Mayorkas. Is that a position that you agree or, or, or might actually support? Or are you looking more long term solutions by proposing this bill? What does uh, impeaching Mayorkas, what does that do to stop the flow? stop people gaming the system, stop the child sex traffickers, the terrorists, the coyotes, people going through uh, Central America to get to Texas. Let, you know, it doesn't do anything. What we need to do is we need to, what, the, what my bill says, talk to Border Patrol, sit with them and tell them, okay, guys, what is it that you need? Well, we need levees, we need uh, structures, we need infrared cameras, we need more Border Patrol, pay them better, give them more benefits, retain them, uh, do some drones, all the technology out there that exists, because this office has sat down with the owners of some of those, uh, of those uh, technology companies that that, that have provided evidence that we can have a highly effective technology-driven seal of the border strategy. Because I'm not the one that is an expert in knowing what is it that we need between point A and point B. Because the border is very long, as I'm sure many people know. We're talking about 2,000 miles. But the technology is out there for each stretch. So here's the money. And you know, the good thing that I didn't mention at the beginning is that the undocumented are going to be paying for that border security. Why? Because in the dignity status, the undocumented, let's say 10 million people, 12 million people are gonna come out and they're gonna pay $5,000 over seven years. According to Leviticus, you know, you forgive people's debt, the Bible. So I'm not, I mean, I'm just going by the big book. 
And that, that amount of money amounts to $45 billion plus. That bucket is going to be used for border security. There is another bucket that is going to be used to retrain, to re-educate the American workers. And why, where does that money come from? Because those undocumented who are now or will be in the dignity status program will be paying 1.5% from, from their paycheck. It will be withheld. You know that when you have a W-2, your employee, employer retains 7% for FICA. Now, instead of the seven, it's gonna be 1.5. That is going to create another pot that is gonna go to retrain American workers. So no one will be able to say that an undocumented, someone that, someone that came from abroad took their jobs away. We're gonna be able to retrain you, whatever you wanna do. If you wanna learn how to be a welder, a new trade, a new occupation, paid by the undocumented. So we're creating two pots, one to pay for border security, the other one to retrain the American workers. Don't you think that's beautiful? And it's not gonna cost the taxpayers one penny. And you know, I appreciate you breaking that down. will be very happy in paying the $5,000 because what they wanna do is they wanna live in dignity. They don't wanna be in the shadows anymore. And if that costs to pay, then they will. Because when my, some of the members of my conference tell me, Maria, that's amnesty is not, and I say, no, it's not amnesty. Amnesty is what we have now, that the undocumented, all those people coming in that do not have a work permit, because that is something that is inconceivable, that the Biden administration is letting thousands upon thousands of people coming in without a work permit. So those people, would love to come out of the shadow and pay for their ride. But dignity, I should say that it applies to those who have been here for more than five years. I appreciate that explanation. It's helpful to break sure. that all down. It's free. I wanted to ask it's for you, free. <laughs> thanks. Um, I want to ask me. you, you're obviously the chairwoman of the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee in uh, foreign affairs and I, 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 foreign relations. I wanted to ask you specifically, you know, the, there was some breaking news last week that was pretty significant, um, a little bit under the radar, but it, it sounds like China now has five facilities or at least is able to be in Cuba. Cuba has allowed that to happen. And the Biden administration has acknowledged that. Obviously, your constituents, you yourself are Cuban. There has been a lot of history between our two countries when it comes to this. But I, I, I want to get your reaction to that. But also, obviously, in, in your position as a subcommittee chairwoman, China has been influencing a lot of Latin American countries. It's not necessarily something that we've seen the U.S. respond to, and that is also our backyard. Can you try to break down uh, this influence that we're seeing and how the U.S. should be responding? Well, Cuba is the is the big cancer in the hemisphere. The rest is just the metastasis. Unfortunately, the, uh, Cast the, uh, the, the Castro uh, revolution has tainted our relations for the last 65 years. China, well, you know, the Castro um, regime is in the business of power. And anything they need to do in order to keep that power, they will do. So now they opened up the island to the Chinese. And we know that the Chinese are also communists. So what is it that we know that China is trying? Can, they, they know that they will not be able to defeat us on, uh, militarily. So they are trying to uh, penetrate Latin America and get as close to us as possible militarily uh, by, by giving money and loans for free to the rest of Latin America or, or very cheap, uh, cheap loans. Um, all I'm saying is that the, the, the White House uh, needs to be a lot more engaged when it deals with Cuba. And we need to uh, understand and remember that Cuba cannot be removed from the terrorist countries list, that Cuba uh, needs to be engaged in a very forceful manner and, and try to um, create a regime change. The Castro Revolution is not in the fa is not in favor of the Cuban people, and it has been demonstrated. 
Cuba uh, used to be uh, one of the most prosperous countries in the hemisphere and right now is below the levels of Haiti. And that is very, um, very unfortunate. So all I can say is that it's a, it's a forceful reaction that needs to come from the Biden administration, uh, something that we haven't seen. On the, on the, the problem is that there's this, this two school of thoughts that, and the Obama proved it, and I know that Obama tried to engage the Cuban regime uh, by providing, giving them everything, every single economic opportunity out there uh, in exchange or hoping that Cuba was going to engage uh, in the international community. And it proved once again that Cuba was in the business of power. They're not gonna give up any market share by giving people freedom and, and allowing them to create their own economy. So bottom line is a very difficult situation and the only way the United States can respond is with forceful, uh, with a forceful fashion and, 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 and send the message to the regime, we're not going to allow that not only to China, but to Russia, that is also trying to do the same thing. They did it 20 years ago in the Lourdes uh, spy station. Now the Chinese are copying that same model. I wanted to ask you, it, it reminds me, I just wanted to ask you quickly, um, when it comes to Latin America, we've obviously also seen a number of countries, their democracies either failing or being extremely tested. And, and this is a reason why we're seeing so many immigrants coming to the border seeking asylum. Dealing with those countries, I, I mean, there there has been a lot of debate about why or if the U.S. should be involved in helping other democracies. Is that something that we should be doing if if the if there is not only foreign threats, but also it, it could mitigate the influx of migrants that we're seeing wanting a new opportunity in the U.S. Of course, and Ronald Reagan proved it. Our backyard, Central America, most people who are undocumented in this country come from those, from Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Honduras. I would say that more than 50% of those people who are here now, who are just coming in, or who have been here for more than five years that could, um, uh, that could join the, the Dignity Program are from those countries. And why? Because Latin America has been abandoned, not only by the Biden administration, but years before. The last guy who recognized that Latin America is our backyard, and we need to help those countries and those political elites who are not always democratic and who are not always clean actors, we need to continue engaging with them so we can bring some of the American values and what they want the most is bring American companies and absorb that, um, that, that labor force that is out there. And the perfect example is Mexico with, the, with NAFTA at the beginning and now the USMCA. Mexico was transformed when we created that trade agreement that kept millions of Mexicans in, at, at home. That, that's the recipe, but we have forgotten about it because unfortunately the United States is sometimes very isolationist. And, uh, and, and that's not the way, that's not the way we need to engage with at least Central America and South America, because they are right there. Geographically speaking, they are next door. So let's engage them and then stop China and Russia from penetrating. It's easy, but it just doesn't get done. It's I appreciate politics. perspective. I appreciate perspective on a number of these issues. I wanted to pivot. I lived there. I was Central American yeah. Bureau Chief for Univision. I lived in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, in Honduras, Panama. Um, um, I didn't live in Mexico, but I know the region very well. Those were my viewers. Um, so I know the perspective and I know how much they love the United States and they're yearning. They're begging the American companies to set up shop in Honduras and Guatemala. The same thing they did in Mexico leave China and come to our backyard. Our lives will be a lot better for them and for us. Thank you for explaining that. Um, I wanted to pivot now to Florida politics. Obviously, I think a lot of the news today is gonna to focus right in your hometown. Um, a big reason why, of course, is because the former president has been indicted. 
there are a number of counts on the on this front, um, including the most willful retention of national defense, uh, conspiracy to obstruct justice, a number of different things. I know you have been critical of that indictment. I think you actually tweeted, quote, America is founded on the rule of law, not on the law of those who govern. Completely understand that, you know, you're innocent until proven guilty. But these are pretty serious charges. Do you doubt the Justice Department bringing them forward? Look, um, I think it's alarming what's happening. I think it's alarming, and I have my notes here, so I will uh, give the specific uh, good information. The treatment of classified information has been questioned by Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, President Biden, and now Trump. So we need to sort of change the rules of the game and explain to the elected officials at the highest level that classified, the treatment of classified information, it's sacred. And those four individuals that I just mentioned apparently either forgot about it or they have not given the proper treatment that the United States justice system uh, merits it. That's the first thing. The second thing is that it's highly alarming that 50% of the electorate or the American people thinks that there is a two-tier justice system. What they do to Trump, they don't do to Hillary. What they do to Trump, they don't do to Biden and Hunter Biden. So it's a um, it's our own uh, responsibility and the responsibility of the news organizations that you know very well that they choose, they pick and choose and say, well, we're not going to cover this so much because it's not so convenient because the people that are on the higher, on the fourth floor, uh, for the Washington Post or in the sixth floor for the New York Times, they don't like Trump that much. They like Biden more. That's not the way it works in this country. That's Central America. And that's why 50% of the American elect electorate is not believing that the DOJ is doing an impartial, rigorous, and unbiased job. And that's the problem. It's not Trump hear you. or Biden. It's not, it's not. The problem is the effect this could have on the institutions of the most respected and the most and the most loved country in the world because of its system, because of its institutions. But if we start corroding that trust, we got a very big problem. Besides Trump, besides Penn, let alone, forget about anybody, human beings is the effect on the institutions and on the system. That's my concern. I hear you on the differences, and, and it's something that Republicans up here have been talking about for, uh, or at least raising awareness for a good number of months. But, you know, when it comes to these classified documents, it's true. Mike Pence, Biden, uh, Hillary Clinton, a number of people have been found with classified documents. The difference, it appears, in this case with Trump, is that he tried to hide a number of these documents. So there is a difference, hide the documents from federal officials. So there is that difference. Of course, this will be litigated in, in a trial, but do you acknowledge that there, at least on this case, that there are some preliminary differences with what previous politicians, including Republican, former Vice President Mike Pence, to what Trump has done? And I understand what you're telling me, but then at the same time, what I could say to you is that I'm not an attorney and I'm not going to be sitting in that jury. But then the DOJ could have said, could have done, uh, or could have treated this case in another fashion instead of taking it to the grand jury to accelerate the process. They could have just charged uh, the, the uh, former president and just let the case take its course, which is something similar to what happened with Hillary. So you see right there, we're not talking about the merits of the charges. We're talking about the way the case has been handled. You see, whether it's A, B, or C, and Hillary is only A and B, maybe, maybe you're right. That's I'm not, we're not here to litigate that. We're here to litigate how both cases were treated and the effect that's gonna have on my constituents and the people that read the newspaper, on the American electorate. Besides, remember, the whole world is watching. And they're saying, huh, you know, this American court system 
may not be as pure as I thought it was. Maybe the FBI is not as rigorous and, and blind and impartial as I thought. So I'm not going to be bringing my money uh, to the United States anymore because now I'm not sure if the courts really will work. That's the problem. I hear you on that. But again, are the charges different? Do you see them as different? I, I, I do see it. But like I said, I don't I don't know the case. I'm not I'm not sure what this what what are the merits or not. I'm only looking at it from 50,000 feet and I'm not going to start giving you my opinion because I'm not an attorney. Like I said, I'm concerned on on what this what implications this is going to have in the future for future generations. And I'm going to believe that if he were to go to jail, I mean, to to, uh, to a jury and to a trial, then let's hope that the justice system will take its course. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying yes or no, it's bad, it's worse. I'm saying let it take its course and see what happens. Because I still believe that we have the best justice in the whole world. So, but we need to, but it needs to be, it needs to be proven once again. Now let's go to Biden. How come the news organizations, the important media in this country, doesn't cover what Hunter Biden did? It's evident. Oh, no. But we don't need to go there because it's not convenient. You see what I'm saying? So <laughs> that can't be that way. For Trump, for Biden, for Hillary, for Pence, for no one. But specifically, you have a major problem, according to all the empirical evidence, that the son of the sitting president is is pretty there are pretty dirty things that apparently he did how come we're not ben, we're not talking about that in the news media and the DOJ has not even wanted to touch it that's a big problem got it well congressman i wanted to ask you of course florida is always 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 a focus in every single presidential race midterm race there are two yeah. Floridians who are running. Um, obviously, Trump is one of them and the current governor, Ron DeSantis. Are you planning to endorse and tell your constituents who they should vote for? Listen, I'm still thinking about it because what I do know that the next president of the United States is coming from Florida. And, you know, I go back. What's the beauty of the system? Let the primary voters determine who they want. We're talking a lot. A lot. Oh, yeah. La, 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 la. What about Iowa, New Hampshire and South Carolina? Maybe they'll say, you know what? I like A and I like F. And everything that we have talked about is uh, it's thin air. So let 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 the court, let the, the process take its course. And that's the beauty of this country. And that's why I'm doing the Dignity Act, because I want to preserve the American exceptionality. And if this country does not have clean rules of the game when it comes to the asylum system, when it comes to the border, when it comes to entering legally in a legal fashion, people in this country, then we are then we are corroding that American exceptionality. And you know, like you said, I'm Cuban American first generation. My parents came from Cuba. Look at that disaster. And look where we are. Millions of the people who elected me were able to come to the promised land, live in dignity, and make a great future for themselves, including my parent. Look at me, I am the American dream. A girl, a brown girl from the hood with an accent is, is the representative of Florida number 27, one of the most vibrant uh, cities in the country. Where does that happen? Here, look at you, Peruvian American, first generation, where you are, in the Washington Post, Jesus. You know what that means. So that is why I'm here, to preserve that American exceptionality. And that goes through Trump, through Biden, through Hillary, through Pence, and it goes through the border. So let's wake up and understand and appreciate what we have. Because I, in my case, I have seen, lived, and covered as a news reporter the other side. And it's pretty ugly. Don't you agree? Well, Congresswoman. I really appreciate that perspective and, and that passion. I think it's something unique to a lot of us in Florida, a lot of us <laughs> Latinas in Florida. So thank you so much. I have so many more questions, but I'm sure I'll find you in the hallways to ask you about them. But I appreciate you making time for us. Thank you. Okay. Of course. Thank for the opportunity. And may the Lord guide us. That's what we need.
My love to you, Mariana. Bye. Thank you again. And for those of you watching, really appreciate you all for tuning in. Of course, if you want to see a number of more of, of our events here at the Washington Post, please tune in to WashingtonPostLive.com. Thanks again for joining us.